Hello and welcome to the next what the heck Togon. video. It's a rainy f***ing day outside today, so I'm filming a video. You know, why not? Today we're going to be doing something that I've wanted to demonstrate. It's very simple. I've wanted to do this for a while though, and it's inspired by my reading of this fantastic book, which instead of keeping all those doggy ears, I've now notated with little sticky notes just to appease the book lovers that might have, well, their pants at the fact that I doggy-eared so many pages. I'm doing the same with my Irresistible Intervals book, and a little bit as well as I read this book on E. So this is a great book too, I'm thoroughly enjoying this. I'm about 100 pages in now, I've only been reading it for a few days, but it's really awesome. Sorry if the uh, sound of the rain gets in the way. I had one more birthday gift from a lovely friend of my brother, The Strange and Infinite World of Numbers, which is a beautifully covered book. It's very nicely matte finished, and I certainly cannot wait to get into it because it's probably got quite a lot of interesting little tidbits on particular numbers that maybe I'd want to show, perhaps. I can't imagine it's got the most rigorous mathematics in it, but I'm sure it'll be interesting to read anyway. So today we're going to be doing a an exploration of a couple of limits that are equal to the euler mascheroni constant, which is, as many of you will know, the limiting difference between the harmonic numbers and the natural logarithm function. And that's really it. I just want to explore a few different ways of writing that, because I think it's very, very interesting how this mysterious number that's clearly probably irrational, but no one has any idea, uh, that's everywhere in analytic number theory, shows up with products of prime numbers somehow, um, is, is, can be written as these very, very neat little limits, yet no one really knows that much about it, yet it pops up everywhere. Um, even like the gamma function, for example. So little gamma is related to big gamma. I think the name was probably a coincidence there, but <clears throat> let's get to it. So as many of you may well know, the harmonic numbers, which are usually denoted h sub n, and written as the sum from k equals 1 to n of the reciprocals of the integers, which is 1 over 1 plus 1 over 2 plus dot 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 all the way up to 1 over n. This sequence, the harmonic numbers, actually diverges. And I'm going to make another video that's going to come out before this, so saying another is a little weird, but the one that's going to come out before this is going to demonstrate a few different ways that you can actually prove that this series diverges, a lot of which I haven't seen done in videos before, but I've seen in sort of these maybe not obscure, but, but small papers on the side that I think are very interesting. But essentially what it comes down to it is, as n goes to infinity, this seemingly very slowly growing series actually does diverge. And likewise, there's the natural logarithm function, which is simply the function that is the inverse of the exponential function, which can be found from the integral representation using the reciprocal of the integers, which is the integral from 1 to n, of 1 over t dt, right? So the area under the curve, 1 over t, from 1 to n, is the natural logarithm of the number n. It's almost a definition. If you want to start from here, you can get all the rules for logarithms from that. If you start with the fact that e to the x is its own derivative, you can derive this using implicit differentiation, that the derivative of the natural logarithm is 1 over x, or t in this case. And the point is, this is almost the discrete version of this because the area under the curve, 1 over t, which looks a lot like this, the area from 1 to n is essentially like this continuously changing variable, right? But if we do it discreetly, like 1 over 1, 1 over 2, 1 over 3, all the way up to 1 over n, then these little steps, right, amount to more than the natural logarithm function, which is the area under the curve, 1 over t. This little overhang in each step that, that total area that you get when you go to infinity sums to one particular number, and it is the difference between the area under all the rectangles and the area under the curve, which is specifically the difference of this sum and this integral right here. I'm not going to prove that this number exists. That's already been done a million times. I'm just going to state its definition now. So from this, we can derive that this number that we're going to call gamma, the euler mascheroni constant, is defined, which is like an equal sign with a little colon in front of it, defined to be the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over 1 plus 1 over 2 plus dot 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 plus 1 over n minus the natural logarithm of n. More succinctly, we can say that this is the limit as n approaches infinity of the nth harmonic number, which is the sum of the first n integer reciprocals, so hn, minus the natural logarithm of n. Right? And in terms of the sums and integrals that we just showed, this is actually the same as the limit as n approaches infinity 
of the sum from k equals 1 to n of 1 over k minus the integral from 1 to n of 1 over t dt, because this is the natural logarithm of n, and this is the nth harmonic number. And so this is sort of a definition, and essentially the difference between this step function and this smooth function approaches a particular value, and it is about 0 0.577. Right, and that goes on seemingly forever. There's no proof that it is rational or irrational, but if it were to be rational, according to the gamma book that I showed you before, the denominator of that number would have to exceed 10 to the power of 242,000. So it could still be, I'm holding out hope, it would be really, really amazing if this number turned out to be rational. You know, because there's, there's always infinitely many more rational numbers to check, so it could be, could be, it's probably not, but it could be. And so my goal today is to derive some more, like, succinct and interesting ways of writing this limit. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a simple change here. Right? We're just gonna, I'm going to rewrite this limit, and I'm going to erase everything else, and we're going to have gamma as defined as that, and, and, and then I'm going to show you how we can write this as a very interesting way. This isn't going to be a particularly long video, because I only have so much to show you in this. These are just interesting limit representations. So, defined as the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum from k equals 1 to n of 1 over k minus the integral from 1 to n of 1 over t dt. But if you take a look at these, this is the same thing as saying 1 over k to the first power and 1 over t to the first power. If you've ever taken a Calculus 2 class, you'll remember p-series comparison for the for infinite series, and if you did a first calculus class, you'll understand antiderivatives of polynomials enough to know that if the power of the of the variable in the denominator is greater than 1, then both of these things converge to to a specific value. What I'm saying is, imagine we redid this. So what we're going to do is we're going to slightly change this. We're going to consider gamma alpha, where this little subscript alpha is going to be the power of this term in the denominator. So k to the alpha and t to the alpha. And we're going to have alpha strictly greater than 1, so that we have to take the limit as alpha approaches 1, and the limit as alpha approaches 1 is going to give us our euler mascheroni constant. But because alpha is strictly greater than 1, we know by p-series comparison that this series is going to converge, and we know from antiderivatives that this integral is going to converge. So we can actually find a particular value for this when alpha is greater than 1. Because now these will converge, we can let n go to infinity, and so we know that gamma of alpha is going to be equal to the sum from k equals 1 to infinity of 1 over k to the alpha minus the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over t to the alpha dt. And now, what is this? This is quite a famous little sum here. This is the backbone of the most famous unsolved problem in mathematics. This is the Riemann zeta function. And if you recall from pretty much any video you've ever watched on it, if alpha is any complex number with a real part that is greater than 1, then this sum is a perfectly valid definition and will converge. So we can write this as the Riemann zeta function applied at alpha. And now using basic anti-differentiation tactics, we can write this as the integral of, of, of t to the negative alpha, right? That's how powers work. And what we can do is simply add 1 to this power and divide it by the new power and evaluate that at the bounds of 1 and infinity. So this is going to be minus t to the 1 minus alpha over 1 minus alpha evaluated at 1 and infinity. Well, if we plug, since we know that alpha is more than 1, we know that 1 minus alpha is going to be less than 0, right? Which means this is going to be a number that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, being raised to a negative power. So raising it to a negative power means 1 over that thing. So we're gonna, so if we plug in infinity, we're going to be getting 1 over a really, 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 really big number. And that number is getting as big as we want, which means plugging in infinity is going to evaluate in the limit this thing to 0, right? So we're going to get 0 for the, for the upper part. And when we plug in 1, we're just going to get 1 in the numerator, because 1 to the 1 minus alpha is just 1. So what we end up with is we end up with the Riemann zeta function at alpha minus 0 for the first part, and then minus minus the next thing, which is just plus, right? So we get plus 1 over 1 minus alpha, right? Which means that we have that this thing, this thing where we, we have alpha greater than 1, and we're taking the sum over the powers of k, uh, the alpha powers of k, and the integral over the alpha powers of t, we end up with zeta of alpha plus 1 over 1 minus alpha, right? But what was this? What, what did we say? We said that alpha was strictly greater than 1, 
but if we let alpha go to 1 in the limit, we must get our original Euler-Mascheroni constant. And that means if we take this expression, which could also be written as minus alpha minus 1, right? If you flip the difference in the denominator, that brings out a factor of negative 1, and I can just flip the sign out front like that. Now, what this allows us to do is if we take the limit as alpha approaches 1 from the right of this thing, we must get our Euler-Mascheroni constant. So this is not a definition now. We defined it to be the original sum that we had where it was just 1 over k and 1 over t. But now from that definition, we've been able to prove that it is equal to this. And this was the first limit that I wanted to show you. So the Riemann zeta function is, in fact, related to the uh, Euler-Mascheroni constant. In fact, the Euler-Mascheroni constant, or, or the Euler constant, or gamma as it's called, is simply the limit as alpha approaches 1 from the right of zeta of alpha minus 1 over alpha minus 1. So this is a very, very beautiful relationship here. Um, there are many other relationships involving the gamma constant and the zeta function, which I will explore in other videos. But I want to show you one more relationship that we can derive sort of going from this step here. Okay? So what we're going to do is set this aside. This is a very beautiful relationship. I hope everybody sees how I got to this. Because remember, this is the Riemann zeta function if alpha is a complex number with a real part greater than 1. Since it is a real number that is greater than 1, this is perfectly well defined, and we can just say this is zeta of alpha. This, using anti-differentiation, gives us the very simple relationship that this integral is equal to 1 over 1 minus alpha. And this probably looks quite familiar to people because this is what we're going to convert into the geometric series. And so you'll see very quickly that this can be related in two uh, very lovely little series. So this is the first relationship I wanted to show you, that the famous Euler-Mascheroni constant is the limit as alpha approaches 1 from the right of zeta of alpha minus 1 over the quantity alpha minus 1. Cool? All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to sort of go from here. So I'm going to erase this now. So we know now that the gamma constant is equal to the limit as alpha approaches 1 from the right, the Riemann zeta function of alpha minus 1 over alpha minus 1. So what I'm going to do is some cosmetic changes. I'm going to rewrite this in its original sum form, and I'm going to do some stuff to this. So this is equal to the limit as alpha approaches 1 from the right of the sum from k equals 1 to infinity of 1 over k to the alpha. Remember, alpha is a number bigger than 1, a real number larger than 1. And so this is just the definition of the Riemann zeta function. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this as 1, as minus 1 over alpha divided by 1 minus 1 over alpha. So all I did was divide the top of the fraction by alpha and divide the bottom of the fraction by alpha. So this is completely equivalent to that right there. But what this allows us to do is rewrite this as the limit as alpha approaches 1 from the right of the sum of k equals 1 to infinity of 1 over k to the alpha minus 1 over alpha. So I'm just bringing this 1 over alpha to the front times 1 over 1 minus 1 over alpha. Because alpha is greater than 1, 1 over alpha must be less than 1, right? Which means this can be written as the geometric series of 1 over alpha because that's within the radius of convergence of the geometric series. So this can be written as the limit as alpha approaches 1 from the right of the sum from k equals 1 to infinity of 1 over k to the alpha minus 1 over alpha. And what's the geometric series? It's the series from k equals 0 to infinity of 1 over alpha to the power of k, right? That's just the definition of the geometric series. So I hope that everyone can see what I've done so far. And all we're simply going to do now is sort of cosmetically change this. We know that we're running over powers of 1 over alpha from k equals 0 to infinity. But if I multiply by 1 over alpha again, that's like having k plus 1 powers. So we could write it from k equals 0 to infinity of 1 over alpha to the k plus 1, or I could start at the power of 1 when I multiply alpha in, like shift every power up by 1, which is perfectly fine. So what we can do is write this as the limit as alpha approaches 1 from the right of the sum from k equals 1 to infinity of 1 over k to the alpha minus the sum from k equals 1 to infinity of 1 over alpha to the k. Which means that we can sort of combine these together since they run over the same indices with the same, and the variable is irrelevant. We could pick the variable to be whatever we want because the limit only depends on alpha. Which, and because they run over the same index, we can combine these together and we get the beautiful, beautiful fact that the Euler-Mascheroni constant is equal to the limit 
as alpha approaches 1 from the right of the, the sum, sun from k equals 1 to infinity of 1 over k to the alpha minus 1 over alpha to the k. A beautiful, beautiful relationship. So it's the difference of a p-series and a geometric series, right? Because k is the k is the index, so this is k is running over the, int, uh, over the natural numbers and alpha is fixed, whereas here the base is fixed and the power is running over the positive integers. So this is a p-series and this is a geometric series. And the difference between a p-series and the geometric series as the exponent of the p-series and the base of the geometric series both go to one from the right, the difference of those two things is equal to the euler mascheroni constant. So this is the second relationship that I wanted to show you in this video. Really, really quite lovely and I hope everyone was able to see what I did in this video.